Well, hey everyone, thanks for joining us today online at Grace Church. It's great to be worshiping with you. My name is Tyler and I am the worship leader at our Grace Canton location. And I'm just so glad that you've taken the time to check out the church and to worship with us today. Um, if you haven't done this yet, I want to encourage you to check out our Grace Church's app. Um, it's really kind of a great one-stop spot for connecting with different ministries or finding different resources, hearing past sermons, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, it's a great way to find out everything that we've got going on. And one of the things you can do on the app is fill out a connection card. And that's really the best way to connect with us, get in touch with us, ask questions, and find out different information that you're seeking. So I encourage you to do that. Well, as a church, we have three values that we kind of let shape everything that we do. Um, number one is worship, and that's something we do every week, whether it's online or in person. Um, and our second value is community. And really the main way that we do that here at Grace is through our community groups, which are, those are our small groups we meet throughout the week. And it's a great way to get to know people. It's a great way to grow spiritually and personally um, with other like-minded people. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, our third value is mission. And that is really where we are the hands and feet of Jesus. We don't want it to just be about our church, but we wanna make a difference in our communities around us. And one of the ways that we're able to do that is through generous giving. And so you can partner with us in that way um, in a few different ways. Uh, you can text 84321 to start a gift there. Um, you can give online at gracechurch.city slash give. You can also give right through our church app as well. But for now, we're gonna transition into our sermon. We're gonna hear a little bit from God's word and we are gonna hopefully learn a little bit more about who God is and who we are. And so I just encourage you to open your hearts and minds as we hear from God's word. Welcome to Grace Church Online. We're so glad that you joined us today as we continue our series called Faith in Action, which is a study through the book of James. Now, the book of James was actually written to Jewish believers who are scattered in different regions of the Mediterranean world where their religious faith and practices was not the dominant expression in society and culture. Much like our world today, in the midst of a complicated and complex world that was both demanding and dangerous, James calls believers to a simple faith in Jesus. Now, James had an inside perspective on what it means to follow Jesus. He was actually the younger half-brother of Jesus. I mean, how is that for some sibling rivalry in comparison, right? James, why can't you be more like your brother? Why can't you be more like Jesus? That must have been pretty hard. But because of that, he had an inside perspective on what it means to follow Jesus. And the focus of the book of James is not on theology, though theology is laced throughout the entire book. But the focus is on practical application, living out the Christian faith where the rubber meets the road. And so we're going to dive right in to James chapter 1, starting from verse 22. And here's what James says to the believers throughout the Mediterranean world. He says this, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. What James is trying to say here is that most of us are educated far beyond the level of our obedience. Let me say that one more time. Most of us are educated far beyond the level of our obedience. I mean, isn't it true that most of us don't need another sermon or another podcast to fill our heads with more knowledge about things that we don't even apply to our lives? We are educated far beyond our level of obedience. We know more than we can ever practice. And that's why James says, do not merely listen to the word. And his focus is on do what it says. Now, to be really clear, James is not dismissing the need to listen to the word of God. Because listening to the word of God is the foundation for doing the word of God. Rather, and this is important, James is warning us against merely listening. 
because it is possible to derive a great measure of satisfaction from merely listening. You could listen to a sermon and go walk away and, and think, that was really good. And there's a great measure of satisfaction in that. And, and the danger is that we assume that because we are listening to the word, that we are growing spiritually in our relationship with God. You see, here's how I would frame it. It is possible to be charmed by the hearing of the word of God without being changed by it. In fact, I would go as far as to say, the more we listen to the word without uh, being taught, without being changed by it, the less likely we will be changed by it because we become hardened to it. We become overly familiar with it. In other words, we become inoculated to the word. And so that's why James says, don't just listen, do what it says. And then he goes on in verse 23 and 24 and says this, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So that's a really great picture there. You see, mirrors in the first century were different than ours. Instead of being made of glass, which was invented in the 14th century, they were made of brushed silver and gave a reflection similar to that of aluminum foil. So just imagine that. And instead of hanging mirrors on the wall, they were placed on a table so a person had to lean over in order to look at himself or herself in the mirror. And so James says that the word of God is like a mirror. But I'm afraid today, too often, we treat the Bible more like a, um, and some of you may remember this, but remember back in the day, those magic eye optical illusions? I mean, how many of you remember those things, right? I mean, if you, and, and here's an example of one right here. And if you stare and gaze at it long enough, then some hidden 3D picture suddenly appears out of nowhere. So, so how many of you can actually see the floating image from this magic eye picture? Can you see it? My theory is that you are all liars. I mean, I have tried so hard, right? You're supposed to stare at it or look through it or whatever that means. I have no idea. I, I've tried moving closer, then taking a step back. I've tried tilting my head, crossing my eyes. I've tried everything and I've never seen anything. And truth be told, I don't think you have either. I think the whole thing is a scam. <laughs> but what I notice is that some people think the word of God is like a magic eye, optical illusion. That if you stare at it long enough in just the right way, if you, if you look through it or read between the lines, that then some hidden meaning will suddenly appear out of nowhere. And so we might engage in academic discussions about the Bible or philosophical debates about the Bible, which is not bad or wrong. In fact, I enjoy some of those debates and discussions, but we do so not so we can follow its teachings better, but oftentimes we do it so we can distract ourselves long enough to ignore the fact that we are not putting our faith into action. We are not applying it to our lives. I, that's why I love what Mark Twain said. He says, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It is the parts that I do understand. Right? The parts that he does understand and, and he doesn't put into action. He doesn't live out. That's what bothers him more than those questionable parts of not, uh, uh, about parts of the Bible that he doesn't understand. And so for most of us, uh, if you're living, if you're watching uh, where we are recording here, uh, like a place like Ann Arbor, where the University of Michigan is, where education is such a high value, we can be deluded into thinking that the accumulation of knowledge and intellectual comprehension is the same thing as obedience. In other words, James is saying, look, you have a knowledge surplus and an obedience surplus deficit. He's saying God's word was never intended to be a magic eye optical illusion with some deep hidden meaning that you're supposed to find. He says it's like a mirror. So think about that. The purpose of a mirror is to accurately reflect what you really look like. 
I mean, and think about it. When we hear the word of God, something, something that happens quite often, and I know that because I'm guilty of it too, is that when we hear the word of God, uh, we, we sometimes conclude that it's talking about somebody else. Right? Have you ever done that? I mean, I hear a sermon and think, uh, I think about somebody else and wish they could hear that message. Oh man, if only my boss could hear this message. Wow, my wife could really use this sermon. But the purpose of a mirror is to accurately reflect what you really look like. The other thing that a mirror does is it provides a context for you to identify imperfections and blemishes that need to be corrected or changed. So how many of you looked in the mirror this morning? And if you didn't, uh, I'm sure other people could tell. But uh, how many of you, after looking at yourself in the mirror, cleaned yourself up to look better? Right? That's what we do. But when you see a blemish on your face, whether it's like baggy eyes or dry skin, maybe it's messy hair or food between your teeth, it is not until you apply something whether it's makeup or cream or paste or lotion, that the mirror has done you any good. And so this sounds really obvious, but let me state the obvious here. Looking in the mirror in and of itself does not make you look prettier. It does not make you look any better, right? You, do you ever look into a mirror and think, oh, yikes, look at those bags under my eyes. Oof, man, I got to do something, right? Look in the mirror doesn't make you prettier. It doesn't change that. Or guys, you walk in front of your mirror without your shirt on one day and you're like, goodness, I need to do something about this beer belly, right? Or gals, maybe you're like, boy, my arms are looking really flabby. Of course, not the gals that are watching online today, but everywhere else, right? And if you do nothing about it, then nothing is going to change. Likewise, simply hearing and listening to the word of God alone does not make you a Christian nor does it make you any more like Christ than looking in a mirror makes you look any better. You have to apply something. You have to act on it. You have to do something. As an illustration, let's pretend that you work for me. In fact, you're my chief operating officer in a company that is growing rapidly. I'm the owner and I'm interested in expanding overseas. So to pull this off, I make plans to travel abroad and stay there until the new branch office gets established. I make all the arrangements and I leave you in charge of the busy stateside national headquarters for six months. And I tell you that I will write you regularly. Let's say via snail mail, because let's say it's before email or the internet. And I I, I say, I'm going to write you regularly, and I'm going to give you specific directions and instructions. After an entire month passes, you've already received a whole stream of letters from me. Five months later, I finally return, and soon after my arrival, I drive down to the office, and I am stunned. Now, just go with me here in this illustration. Let's say grass and weeds have grown up really high on the lawn. A few windows along the street are broken. I walk into the lobby and the receptionist is doing her nails, chewing gum, listening to NPR. I look around and notice the waste baskets are overflowing, the carpets haven't been cleaned, and nobody seems concerned that I've returned. So I ask about your whereabouts and someone in the crowded lobby uh, points down the hall and says, "Uh, I think she's down that way. So A little perturbed, I move in that direction and bump into you as you're finishing a chess game with our sales manager. So I ask you to step into my office, which has been temporarily turned into a television room for watching afternoon sitcoms or something. And I ask, what in the world is going on? And you respond, "Uh, what do you mean, Sung? And I say, well, look at this place. Didn't you get any of my letters? You say, letters? Oh, oh, yeah, sure. We got every single one of them. As a matter of fact, we've had letter study groups every Tuesday night since you left, and we've discussed many of the things that you wrote about. Some of those things were really interesting, and you'll be pleased to know that a few of us have already committed to memory some of the sentences and paragraphs that you wrote. One or two of us have memorized an entire letter or two. I mean, great stuff in those letters sung. Uh, and then I say, okay, 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 you got my letters. You studied them, you meditated on them, you discussed them and even memorized them. But what did you do about them? And you say, do? 
We didn't do anything about them. You see, we fall into the trap of believing that information equals transformation. Information equals transformation. And because most of us think of it this way, we think, I receive information, and because of that information, the result is transformation, which then leads me to application, right? I live out that, that truth. And James says, no, 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 you, you don't get it. You receive information, and then comes application. You have to do it, which then leads to transformation. Think of it in terms of exercising and working out. You know, you may receive information on how to perform certain exercises, but that alone does not result in any transformation. Unless there is application, there will be no transformation. In fact, I remember um, when I was in college, my parents called me one day and they told me about how excited they were about getting a set of Jane Fonda aerobic VHS videos that they had purchased, right? This was a while ago, so VHS videos. Some of you don't even know what VHS is. But that summer, after, after my freshman year in college, when I came back from school, I walked into the hallway of our house where I could hear the aerobic exercise video playing in the living room right around the corner. And I could hear, I, I could hear the video, uh, video uh, going, and my dad, hearing me come walk through the door, uh, yelled over at me and said, hey, Sung, you have to check out this video. It's a really great workout. Well, I turned the corner, and there were my parents sitting on the couch, eating ice cream while they were watching the new Jane Fonda aerobic workout video. And again, right, that is a great picture of sometimes what we think happens, right? We fall into the trap of believing that information alone means that we will be transformed, that information equals transformation. I hear some people who like to study the Bible, as do I and many of you, say that they like to go deep, Right? You're, have you ever said that or heard people say that? And you hear that about sermons sometimes, right? Oh, man, some, that, that was great. That, that sermon was so deep. Or people will say, I left that church because the sermons weren't deep. And go, going deep is a good thing. I mean, I love reading and learning and gaining insights. In fact, I read one or two books, nonfiction books, every single week, Right? But let's not assume that going deep necessarily leads to life change. The danger of going deep is that it can uh, it can lead you to believe that because you have heard or read something profound or deep, that life change is happening. You think you're moving forward when, in reality, you're stuck in place. You're not moving anywhere. Right? That, that's a danger uh, of thinking that knowledge equals transformation. Something like this happened this morning as I was driving into the office. I was sitting at a red light in my car, just minding my own business, listening to, the, listening to some music and things, waiting for the red light to turn green, when all of a sudden I had the sensation that my car was moving forward. So all of a sudden I looked around, I, I pressed on the brakes harder, But my car kept moving forward, and and, and I didn't know what was going on until I realized that the car next to me was actually moving backwards, right? She was actually, she had crossed the the, the line uh, and what was in, in in the walking lane, and so it was moving backwards, but it gave me the illusion that I was actually moving forward, when in fact, I was stuck in place. I was not moving anywhere. Maybe you've had that experience sitting at a red light or when your car's been parked. That same reality happens when we think that information equals transformation. Let's revisit James chapter 1, verse 23, 24. He he says this, Anyone who listens to the word but does not do it, do what it says, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now, the word looks and looking here refers to a quick glance, right? You, you, you look at yourself in the mirror, it's a quick glance. 
So I used to coach high school flag football. And, and during halftime, many of the guys, we, uh, you know, they would go and they would see themselves in the mirror. And, and you know, when they see those, saw themselves in the mirror, I mean, their, their clothes are caked in mud because it was raining. Their shirts are ripped because, you know, we, we did a little bit more than just flag football. And their hair and faces are all dirty and disheveled. And do you imagine that they would get in a frenzy about trying to clean themselves up? No, not at all. I mean, all they wanted to do was get back outside and play the second half. Yeah, they saw themselves in the mirror with all the dirt and mud, but they hardly flinched over it. It was just a quick glance in the mirror and right back out to play. Isn't that like some of us? We see ourselves in the mirror of God's word. We see all the dirt and mud in our soul and in our hearts, and we may see something God is requiring of us, but it's just a quick glance and we were quickly back out doing our own thing, forgetting all about what God revealed. And so we never get around to putting into practice the knowledge that God has given us. And so we become forgetful listeners. Now, in contrast to that quick glance where James talks about in verse 24, the next verse he says this, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now the word here for looks intently in the Greek means not to quick, uh, glance quickly, but rather to stoop over and to look into, to gaze carefully by the side of, or, or to, to peer or to peep into, to bend over for a closer look, investigation and examination of something. So you can see it has a whole different meaning in the original. So this isn't a passing glance like in verse 24. And unlike the illustration of the high school flag football team who simply made a passing glance of themselves in the mirror and quickly ran back out to play the second half, this can be illustrated by a high school kid about to go on his first date. So imagine while preparing for his date, he looks into the mirror and sees a pimple on the end of his nose. Do you think he's going to give a mere glance at what he sees in the mirror? Not a chance. I mean, anxious about his upcoming date, he's going to stare at it, pick at it, cover it with kind of makeup so it's not as noticeable. There's no way he gives us a passing glance. On the contrary, he gazes carefully at the imperfection he sees in the mirror. He, he bends over for a close look, uh, investigates and examines in hopes of finding a remedy before his date. So let's be honest. Looking in the mirror is not always a pleasant experience. For some of you, as God places that mirror in front of you, God may be speaking to you about something you need to start doing. Maybe he's asking you to re-engage with God's word and re-engage with God's people. Maybe he's asking you to slow down in your busy schedule to listen to the Holy Spirit. Maybe he's asking you to pray for your enemies or, or serve others. For others of you, uh, it may be something that you need to stop doing. Maybe he's asking you to stop sleeping with your girlfriend or treating your husband like a dog or your wife like a slave. So I, I want to share a couple applications uh, with you today. Three applications in particular. First, there's a warning to heed here uh, in what James is talking about. James says, those who merely listen deceive themselves. So this is a warning to anyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus. He says, look, it is possible to know a lot about the Bible and still not be a follower of Jesus. It is possible to be active in a local church and still not be a follower of Jesus. It is even possible to affirm all the truths of Christianity and yet not be a follower of Jesus. Knowing the facts, knowing the information about Jesus is not the same as trusting him and having a relationship with him. And so I want to encourage you to take a hard look at your life. What makes you believe that you are a child of God? Is it because you were raised that way? or because you go to church on occasion or pray whenever you can. You can do all those things and still not be a child of God. To be a child of God means you surrender your life and follow Jesus. And so first, the application is just a consideration, a warning to heed. But second application is a, is a command to obey. The admonition, admonition of James is to be doers of the word. 
That is a person who responds to God's directives. So let's get really practical. Is there a sin that you need to confess? Is there a problem that you need to stop ignoring? Look, God God doesn't expect you to be perfect, but he does want you to be honest. We need to admit when we have fallen short of God's standard. In what ways is God calling you to change your course? Is he pressing you to change a certain behavior or attitude or heart posture? Does he want you to reach out to someone, to forgive a hurt, or to express kindness to somebody who needs it? Is God calling you to step out in faith? Perhaps he's calling you to start a new ministry. You see, the real test of faith is not what we say as much as what we do in response to what God says. So that's a command to obey. Finally, third application. There's a promise to claim here. The promise of uh, the good news of Jesus. See, the problem is that when we talk about, uh, about doing and uh, responding to what God says, the problem is that we can't do it. You cannot do it in your own strength and power. The life of obedience is not something that we do in order to be loved and accepted by God. And James will make this point over and over again throughout his letter. James is not telling us that we have to earn our salvation by doing good things. He says we are not saved by what we do. Instead, we are made right with God by what Christ has done for us. And that's a promise for us to claim. It's the good news of Jesus. It's not about you being good enough to earn God's love and to earn salvation. He has done that work. When he died on the cross, he he lived a life that only he could live, the perfect life, and he died on our behalf, the death that we deserve on the cross. His death is payment for for our sins, for all who trust in him. And so, friends, that is a promise that we claim today. We surrender, we come to the foot of the cross, and we, we, we claim that promise of, of him giving us his righteousness and making us right with God. Not because of our good works, not because of our obedience, but in, in response to God's grace and what he's done for us. Our natural response is that we don't want to just merely listen. We want to do what God says out of gratitude and out of love and affection for our Heavenly Father. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Let's pray. So Lord, you reveal your word to us. And as you reveal your word, help us and empower us by your Holy Spirit to live out in practice the things that you command, the things that you tell us to do, the things that you tell us not to do. Lord, as we look into the mirror of your word, may we be responsive and not just listeners, but may we be doers of your word. Lord, help us in your mercy and grace. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us online at Grace Church today. I hope that message was encouraging to you. Um, And I just want to reiterate those three values that we talked about at the beginning of the service of worship, community, and mission. As a church, we wanna be thinking about how we can do those throughout the week, not just on Sundays. So for you personally, be thinking about how you can worship between Monday and Saturday. Be thinking about how you can be living in community with other believers, whether it's through our community groups as a church, whether it's through your relationships that you have, and then also be thinking about how you can live a life on mission, where you can tangibly be the hands and feet of Jesus. And I think when we all do that, that's when we'll experience that real deep relationship with God, and we'll also see that we are making a difference in the community around us. Well, in the meantime, I hope you have a great week. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you back here next week online at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. You also have the option to join us in person at any of our church locations. But until then, go and be the church.